Absolutely. Okay, let's try this. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The challenge for us in our lesson this morning is to talk about transformation and what that means. And for several uh, months, I was attending a class on Sunday mornings that the classroom at the church building was shared uh, with a younger group of people on Wednesday nights. There were uh, adults in there on Sunday mornings, about fifth and sixth graders in there on Wednesday nights. Now, what that means in very common and simple ways is that the bulletin boards and the classroom decoration generally accommodated the Wednesday night group. And uh, the Sunday morning folks, those of us that were a little bit older, got to enjoy some of the things that were shared. I want to recreate one of the <clears throat> bulletin boards in that particular room where it asked the question, God just wants me to be, and then of course it was a question mark of happy. And there were a couple of um, verses up on the board. They weren't spelled out, just the references were there, but we're going to look at them real quick this morning. One of them was in 1 Peter 1 at verse 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Your translation might say all manner of conduct. Another passage that was mentioned was 1 John 3 at verse 7. Where the Bible says, little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. And so you notice those two, and then, of course, it had the word happy with the question mark there, but it had tactfully crossed that out and put words like holy and righteous. Because, you see, you can search the pages of your Bible, and what you will find is nowhere... Has God promised us happiness? Certainly not happiness by our own definition in this life. Now, that's what some would want you to believe. They would want you to believe that you can do exactly what you want to do. You can be who you want to be, and you just do whatever makes you happy. The Bible does not teach that. It teaches things like holiness and righteousness. In fact, a word that keeps coming up is the word contentment. Or the passage that we have here in Romans 12, at verse 2, the word transformed. God would want me to live a transformed life. Sometimes it is really interesting, at least it's interesting to me, to notice some of the words that are used in the original language that are translated into our English Bibles. And one of the words that if you look it up in an interlinear, you'll see the word there, and it looks something like this. Now, if you don't know much about Koine Greek, that probably doesn't mean much to you. But there were some people that have done different types of work over the years. One of them decided that they were going to do what's called a transliteration process. That's not translation, but transliteration. And that's simply taking the English letters that make the same sounds as our Greek letters up here and spelling it out in an English form of sorts, and it would look something like this. Now, if you were to pronounce that, that would be metamorphoste. And all I want you to see this morning is that the word here is closely related to our English word metamorphosis. Can we go back to biology for just a few moments? You may have noticed the first slide there had a picture of a butterfly, but it wasn't just any butterfly. If you will notice, that butterfly is emerging from a cocoon. It had just completed a transformation, a metamorphosis process. Butterflies aren't born butterflies, right? We know that they come into the world as caterpillars, and then through the maturation process and going through the growth and development, they eventually find themselves in a cocoon. And then they will emerge from that cocoon not as a caterpillar, but rather as a butterfly. And it's interesting that at least in our language, 
we don't even call it the same thing anymore. They have completed metamorphosis. They have completed a transformation. You can see the same idea. Oftentimes, the illustration is used in terms of tadpoles that turn into frogs and toads. And of course, they're not born frogs and toads, but they are born tadpoles. And you notice that they go through, again, this maturation process, this metamorphosis. And when they complete metamorphosis, they don't look anything like they did before. Can we make a couple of observations about metamorphosis from the biology world? One observation that I point out to you this morning is that metamorphosis is a drastic change. Butterflies do not resemble caterpillars. Frogs do not resemble tadpoles. It is a drastic change. It is a complete, total transformation, if you'll let me use uh, that word. But another observation that I want to make with you about the idea of metamorphosis is, friends, it is a permanent change. Think about this. As we consider a caterpillar transforming to a butterfly, once a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, there's no going back, is there? It is a complete, total change. It is a permanent change. The same thing can be said for our frogs and toads. They don't go back to being tadpoles. Once they complete metamorphosis, it's a permanent change. It has never been in God's plan for someone to become a Christian and then return back to the world. God wants that change to be drastic. He wants that change to be permanent. Now this might be where the illustration falls apart just a little bit because we know God's made provisions for that plan. Certainly once you've fallen back into the world, you have opportunity sometimes to come back to God. Certainly we can re uh, come back and think about those things. But what I want you to see, remember the Greek word there, metamorphose, transformation is metamorphosis. That's the kind of word that the Apostle Paul chose to use when he decided to talk about be ye transformed. Metamorphosis, a drastic change, a total change. It's complete, it's permanent. That's what God desires of all people everywhere when we decide to choose to do his will and to become saved. Transformation is metamorphosis. So the question that we want to ask today is how do we transform, or if you'll let me use this word, how do we metamorph like God wants us to metamorph? Like God wants, every time I say that, I think about the mighty morphin Power Rangers. Is that just me? Our young people don't get that anymore because it's even past their generation. How do we change sinful to holy? How do we make the process of metamorphosis, the process of transformation, how do we complete that and become acceptable in God's sight? Now, we've already looked at it, but we'll return to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, be ye metamorphed, <laughs> transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now right here in this text, we have three thoughts that we're going to consider, three ideas that are presented in the text. We're not going to observe the exact same order as Paul observed, as they're mentioned here, we're going to kind of jump around this text a little bit this morning. But there's three thoughts or three ideas that I want to call your attention to as we engage in this process, as we think about the process of metamorphosis, the process of transformation. How do we change sinful to holy? Now, before we get into that, let me make one other comment 
And that is, friends, I would suggest that this is a difficult process. Every single one of us has struggled with this, at least on some level. We've all looked at times in our lives where we're thinking, I didn't live in the kingdom on that day. I didn't live transformed on that particular day. Some of us have periods of our lives where we look back and think, I was not holy in that time of my life. And every single one of us feels the lure back into the world. Satan is active. And he's working. He's working to get us to transform back. He's working to get us to go back into the world. That's what we want to avoid. And Paul gives us some ideas presented in these two verses that will help us. For those of you with a background in uh, psychology and counseling, I'm going to do a shout out here. You will notice some uh, very strong correlations between what's presented here in Romans 12, 1 and 2 and what is commonly known as cognitive behavior therapy. And all that simply means is that if we change our thought process, then perhaps our behavior will follow. And there's certainly a place for that. I don't subscribe to everything that cognitive behavior therapy has to offer, but I do use quite a bit of it in my line of work and think about some different things. But you'll notice that right here, the first thing that we're going to consider this morning, Paul says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let's think about this word renew for a few moments this morning. This idea of renewing of your mind. You know, first, I would suggest there's some synonyms that we can think about. Synonyms like change. When we renew something, we, we change it. In fact, some of the uh, original language leaves with it the idea of things that are brand new versus things that are remodeled, but both ideas can be translated new. You can remodel your kitchen or you can get a whole new kitchen, but when it's all done, you look and say, I got a new kitchen. Those transformation, that renewing is a change. But we can also see that it's a change of the mind. So we're going to use words like determine, determination, or resolve, things that help us to consider the things about which we think. And friends, there are some passages in the New Testament that help us to better understand this that are consistent with what's presented here in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Passages like Philippians 2 at verse 5, where the Bible says, let this mind be in you, thought process, which was also in Christ Jesus. I suggest Jesus takes us back to the matter of what we think about and our behavior will likewise follow. Passages in the same book, Philippians 4 at verse 8, where there's several things mentioned, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, and so on and so forth. But notice the last phrase, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, watch it now, think on these things. Have you ever had difficulty with your thought process? I mean, things just pop in your head and you say, I don't know why I'm thinking about this. I don't know why I'm even considering this. I wish it would just go away. And maybe you have said what I have heard some young men at the facility in which I work say. They'll say things like this, but I just can't help it. Those thoughts just pop in my head. I just can't help it. That's what I think. And when I think that way, I get angry. And when I get angry, I yell and scream. And on and on and on they go. So one young man that used this very phrase, I was talking about his thought process with him and thinking about some different things. And he said, Jeremy, I, I just can't help it. These bad thoughts, these evil thoughts just pop in my brain and I just think about them. So I talked to him for just a little bit. I said, I got a couple of unusual questions for you, but I want you to take me serious for just a few moments. They have a hard time doing that. And I want you to answer these questions. I said, can you tell me what kind of music you listen to? He said, well, it's a gangster rap. That was how he said it. I was too old to know what that was, I guess. So I had to look it up, figure it out. I said, okay, can you tell me what kind of TV you watch? When you have the opportunity, when you're not in a facility such as where you're at now, when you're at home and you have free reign over the television, 
Can you tell me what kind of thing? Oh, Mr. Jeremy, it'd be, it'd be pretty violent. But can you tell me what kind of people you hang around? Well, they're not going to be people you like, Mr. Jeremy. <laughs> can you tell me what kind of video games you play? Oh, they're pretty rough. They're violent. You don't allow them here. <laughs> Friends, do you want the solution to this thought of, I just can't help it? There's another phrase that some of you have heard. It's called garbage in, garbage out. And I had to help that young man to see that what he was putting into his mind was indeed coming out in his behavior. You know, that's true for so many of us. We think that we don't have the influence of music and television and so forth, but it, it, we do. It comes up over and over again. We put the garbage into our brains, and the poor behavior comes out. And you can understand that when you look at it and think about that, but then when it comes time to turn the television off, nobody wants to do it. I want to suggest to you that there are some things in our lives revolving, this word, revolving around this word renew that help us to better understand. Now, I was impressed <clears throat> when I put this PowerPoint together. It was just two or three years ago, and even then, I, I thought about the pictures that were on here, and some of these are pretty old pictures, but I think you'll get the idea. You know, sometimes we sit, TVs don't look like that quite that much anymore, do they? But this concept of sitting in a recliner and looking at the television is something that we certainly do quite, quite a little bit, isn't it? Most of us can relate to that scene. Or you can think about the computers, and again, I would suggest computers, don't, most of them don't look like that anymore. They're laptops or even the post-PC devices and things along those lines. But do you find yourself guilty <laughs> of holding up the phone or the uh, iPad or whatever it might be and looking and thinking about social media and other things along those lines and, and looking and put, feeding your brain? with things that aren't right. Or we can certainly think about the music. Again, it doesn't look quite the same. Now it's a combination music, phone. They hadn't got it to pump your gas yet, but I guess that's common. You can think about all this stuff. Or we look at the friends that we hang around, the people that we're with, the places we go, the work that we do. None of these things oftentimes allow us to renew our mind. So the tr process of metamorphosis, remember, I said it's a drastic process. It's a, a complete, a total process. Sometimes we have to do what nobody else would do. Sometimes we have to engage in things that people would look at us and say, are you crazy? You're really going to get rid of those things in your life? But the, everybody's got a television. And we think about these different ideas, but friends, some of these things need to go away. Because garbage in, garbage out. It doesn't help us to renew our minds. Think about another concept that Paul mentions earlier here in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. And that is the idea of present your bodies. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. You see words like holy. You see words like sacrifice. We'll get there here in just a, a few moments. But again, we can think about some synonyms to this concept of present. Present your bodies. Synonyms like action. Presentation requires action. Behavior. Or one word, here's an action word, the word doing that we can think about. And again, you will notice that there are some familiar passages to us that end up being consistent with what Paul presents here. Passages like James 1 at verse 22, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Or in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said it this way, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth, you'll notice the continual action type word that's mentioned there he that doeth the will of my father in heaven may i make a suggestion to you when we talk about this idea of actional living when we talk about this idea 
of presenting our bodies, of behaving in such a way that will show people that we live the transformed life, that we live life in the kingdom of God, we make a big distinction sometimes about the concept of dying for Christ. And certainly there are some passages, Revelation 2, verse 10, for example, that teach us, no doubt, we must be ready to give our lives. If it comes down to giving your life for the cause of Christ, for the cause of the cross, God has said you do that. If obedience to me is going to require the sacrifice of your life, God says do it. Because the blessings in eternity far outweigh those things. I don't know where this culture will be in 50 years. I don't know where we'll be in 10 years. Or even 5 I don't guess I have any clue where we'll be tomorrow, although we can make some pretty educated guesses. The further out we plan, the less secure our plans become. But I know where we're at right now. And friends, I want to encourage you, certainly dying for Christ is what we're called to do. If that's what we need to do, that's what we, we, we should do. At this point in time, we're not being called to die for Christ. If that time comes, let's step up to the call. Let's go ahead and obey that. I'm ready for it. Are you? But that's not where we're at today. That's not what we're doing right now. And perhaps you've had the same struggle that, yeah, I'm willing to die for Christ, but maybe you're not quite ready to live for Christ. You stand in good company. You know, the apostle... Peter was standing with our Lord in the upper room and Jesus made a powerful statement when he said one of you will deny me do you remember what Peter said not me Lord I'll die for you Lord I'll die for you and I believe that he was prepared to die I mean they stood in the garden you remember it was Peter that pulled uh, the dagger first he pulled uh, made the first move when they were coming to take Jesus into custody, probably a flinch or something, and ended up cutting off the ear of Malchus. If you do some word studies on the multitude of the great band that was gathered together on that occasion, you will find that the, Jesus and his apostles were outnumbered by drastic ways. I have no doubt Peter didn't think he was coming home from that alive. He was prepared to die. But God didn't call him to die at that moment. Jesus said, not this way. He put that ear back on and said, no, it's not going to happen. I'm going to go willingly. Peter wasn't prepared to live for Christ. If we're called to die, let's die. But in the meantime, friends, let's live. And the way Romans puts it, he says, you present your bodies a living sacrifice. I want to share with you a few ideas about sacrifice. First, sacrifice has to cost you something. It is not a sacrifice if you don't feel it. If it doesn't cost you. It is indeed uncomfortable. I struggle with this, with giving, because I'll give so much and think, oh, yeah, this is uncomfortable, but then you get used to it after a while. So you've got to give a little more to make it uncomfortable again, right? A sacrifice is a gift. It's something that we willingly offer. And in the case here in Romans chapter 12, it's presenting our bodies. It's about behavior. Our behavior must cost us, must be uncomfortable, must be a gift. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. You know what happened? There was a group of people in the first century that we call the Corinthians. And it says that they were several different things, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, and so forth. Now, Paul was clear. He said, these types of people will not enter the kingdom of heaven. I can't get past the last few lines. And such were some of you. But you have been washed. Ye are sanctified. Ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. There was a group of people that were transformed. Their behavior changed in what they were doing. But we also know from our text 
that we must renew our minds, change the way we think, which will in turn change our actions. And finally, the text says, let's prove what is good. Again, we can notice some synonyms. Synonyms like test, or you may think about examine. I love the word discernment or discern. And again, you will notice that there are some passages in our New Testaments that are consistent with this particular idea. Passages like 1 Thessalonians 5 at verse 21, where the Bible says prove, one translation says test all things. And then it tells us once we put whatever it is to the test, if it's good, it says hold fast to that which is good. Take it and cling to it. But if it's bad, abstain from it. Get away from it. It's not good for you. So our actions, our behaviors, the things that we think about, we need to put it to the test to see if it is consistent with the transformed life. Or passages like Proverbs 23, buy the truth and sell it not, also wisdom and instruction and understanding. I find it interesting that Paul in Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us what to prove. He says, prove what is good, what is acceptable. And you'll notice he says, prove the will of God. When we measure our behavior to the standard, we can easily determine whether or not the behavior is part of the transformed life, part of the metamorphosis in which we should engage so we renew our minds but we present our bodies and by presenting our bodies that sacrifice we prove that god is right we prove the will of god i beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of god that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to god which is your reasonable service and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You may remember in our introduction, we asked this question. We said, how do we transform? How do we metamorph? Or one way that we reworded was, how do we change our behavior from sinful to holy? Right here in this text, Paul says, renew your mind, present your body, and prove God's will. Will you pray with me? Father, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for the opportunity that we have to live for you. Father, we ask for strength and for courage that we can live the transformed life, that we can live life in your kingdom, and according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. The question really comes down to, are you living the transformed life? Are you, have you completed the process of metamorphosis for God? We want you to know that you can do that. It's not too late. Time is still around. And we know that there may be those that are gathered here today that haven't become saved, haven't been baptized for the remission of sins, we want you to know you can do that before it's everlastingly too late. We also know that there may be, there probably are some here, that realize they haven't been living the transformed life. They may have completed metamorphosis, but they've gone back into the world. We want you to know that it's not too late. If we can help you in any spiritual way, we ask that you come to the invitation of Jesus. While together we stand and sing. Jesus is tenderly called.